nothing is left today of the castle that once stood on Rochdale's skyline. Henry Fishwick, in A History of Lancashire, tells us that in the time of Edward the Confessor, the last Saxon king, AD 1041 to 1066, most of the land in Rochdale was held of the king by Gamal the Thane. Part of this land was free from all duties except Danegeld. There can be little doubt that a Saxon thane of this order had both his castle and the accompanying church. As to the existence of the former, it is placed beyond dispute by the name Castleton, which occurs in many very early deeds. This castle, probably then in ruins, stood on the elevated ground still known as Castle Hill. Hello, and welcome to my first video. Uh, my name's Mike, and on this channel, over the next few months, you're gonna see uh, a variety of videos dealing with things like urban exploration, urban archeology, span uh, local history, but also history more broadly. Um, before I begin, uh, I just want to give a couple of shout outs. Uh, the first is to one of my favorite channels on YouTube, and that's Martin Zero's channel. Uh, Martin, I must say, has been one of my biggest inspirations for actually starting this channel. Uh, his channel is incredible. He goes to all sorts of sites and records everything, gives the history, looks at old maps, uh, compares it to how it is now, uh, explains what things are in a way that's very understandable to someone who, you know, may have absolutely no idea what they're looking at. Uh, his channel is amazing. Please, please go and check it out if you're into this sort of thing. Uh, but the person who has really sort of pushed me to get this project going, has encouraged me to actually start doing this, uh, is Alana Marie. Now, uh, Alana has a YouTube channel. It's quite different to mine. Um, there she discusses uh, how to become an actor, what, what you're going to encounter in your first audition, uh, your first rehearsal, um, what you'll encounter in lessons, the sort of techniques that you're going to need to use, etc. Uh, it's excellent stuff. Please go and check her channel out. She's been incredible help. She's given me advice for how to find copyright free pictures and videos and music and things like that. She's helped me get to grips with my editing software. Uh, yeah, she's just been brilliant. Um, she's been really inspiring as well. So please go and check her out. More than the acting videos as well, she also does several vlogs. Uh, and yours truly turns up in a few. So that's worth watching, isn't it? So today, uh, we're going to be discussing Rochdale's Long Lost Castle. Now, as I said, the Thane Gamel, uh, whose name was a Saxon word meaning old, uh, was the then lord of the area that's now known as Rochdale. Uh, he lived... Uh, and owned land in Rochdale, both before and after the Battle of Hastings, at which time it was known as Residum, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And he was one of 21 thanes in, the, in what was called the Salford Hundred, although at that time Rochdale itself was in uh, the county of Cheshire. Uh, being a thane, and it's spelled T-H-E-G-N, is different to being like a, a thane in the sense of Macbeth. Um, it means that he was a landowning freeman, obliged, therefore, to fight for the king. Uh, and it's hard to disagree with Fishwick's assessment that such a man is going to have had a castle. You know, he's, he's going to have defended his lands somehow. So let's take a look at Rochdale as it is today. From above, it probably looks like pretty much any other ex-industrial northwestern English town, or probably just about any other town in England or the UK, to be honest with you. Uh, but there are a few ways in which this town would be recognisable to someone from, say, two to three hundred years ago, in spite of all the changes that have happened. One is the road layout. Now, obviously, we've got all these sort of urban developments, all the side streets and ex-slums and things like that, and places where mills have been knocked down. Um, but the essential road layout, this sort of strange potpourri of uh, medieval and modern, 
still exists. It still forms the backbone of Rochdale to this day. Uh, roads like Manchester Road here, Drake Street, Oldham Road, Milnro Road, they go back hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, the other thing that goes back another couple of hundred years is the canal. And finally, the other thing that would really convey that this was the same place to them is the river. The river flows into Rochdale from the northeast, the River Roach, that is, and it winds its way into the town centre, diving under the town centre just here. It used to be considered the widest bridge in the world, this, uh, but we've lost that status now because they reopened it not long ago. Um, so the river now emerges for a short while, goes under St Mary's Gate, uh, which actually replaced the lower part of Manchester Road, um, round where the old cricket pavilion used to be, under Mellor Street, and into what is known as Sparth Bottom. Why is the river significant to this castle? Well, it's all to do with this area here, this patch of land. This is what we're going to be focusing on today. So let's see what this place looked like, say, about 120 years ago. Look at that. So obviously we have the hill. You can see uh, the outline of the great house that's on there, the Georgian house from 1820. You can see St Albans Church, these two features that could both be seen in the opening of the video. But what it also tells us, one of only two maps that I've seen that actually do tell us this, is that it was the site of Rochdale Castle, and that that is why it's called Castle Hill. So, as A. Bowden puts it on the website LancashirePass.com, the site was a strategic one, chosen for its high lookout point. Beneath was the meeting of the Roach and Spodden rivers, with the River Roach originally flowing around the base of the cliff some 100 feet below. Um, Willoughby Gardner, FLS, in the 1908 book The Victoria History of the County of Lancashire, Volume 2, explains further that the remnants of the castle's earthworks are situated upon the top of a lofty natural hill composed of sand and gravel, which forms a northwest spur of the high ground to the south of the River Roach. The hill attains an altitude of 480 feet above sea level and towers some 100 feet above the low ground beside the river, which now runs about 200 yards away to the north. He continues, uh, The eminence is triangular in shape, with its base towards the south, its northwest, north, and northeast sides are exceedingly steep slopes, at the bottoms of which ran the roach in one case and a little rivulet running into it in the other. The south side is less steep, and its foot is joined by a neck of fairly high ground to the elevated hamlet of Castleton beyond. In early days, the waters of Castle Mere, whose name is preserved in a road nearby, uh, spread out broadly a quarter of a mile away to the east. The site effectually overlooks the ancient ford called Trefford, which crossed the Roach just below it to the north. The view from the spot is very extensive, and the command is of course complete. Fishwick has also provided us with this drawing. Uh, from left to right is from south to north. Now, it was drawn to show the effect on the hill by the extension to Manchester Road, labelled in the drawing as New Turnpike Road from Manchester to Rochdale. The then new road essentially clips the hill, whose shape has been further altered by the construction not only of houses leading up its summit, but by Castle Hill Row. Castle Hill Row is today occupied by a nursery, but seen here on the early 1900s map, we can see that it was a row of terraces at the time. Now, the area once occupied by the castle was, until the end of the 19th century, known as Castleton. Uh, this is definitely a Saxon word. Uh, the ton aspect, the ton part of the word, uh, means farmstead. However, uh, the castle part is a little more interesting because that derives from the Saxon word seister or seister. I'm not quite sure how you pronounce it. And that did mean castle or fortification, but it referred uh, to one belonging to an earlier time. So, say, a Roman fortification or uh, an Iron Age fortification. So a Saxon word indicating, yes, a Saxon fortification because of Gamalt's presence, uh, but, with the, um, but a Saxon word that refers to a fortification built by earlier occupants too. 
Uh, the only conclusion I can reach here is that the site has been defended since pre-Saxon times. Uh, there may have been a castle at another location in Saxon times, uh, and this was simply called Castle Hill because of what was there before. It's hard to say. There, there's no conclusive evidence on this. However, since the Norman conquest of 1066, uh, such sites have gained an association with and are indicative of castles of the Motton Bailey construction. There are examples extant all over the country, uh, all at similarly prominent and well-defended sites. But it is in Fishwick's illustration that we receive near confirmation of the Norman Mott and Bailey theory, precisely because he shows us the lay of the land before the construction of the 1820 house, which was built on the site of the demolished Mott. We can see that at the top of the image is a small raised area, accompanied by a larger area slightly lower down, which was typical. Bowden explains that the Mott was a high steep mound with a wooden castle keep on top. Beneath it was a large flat bailey area that would contain the buildings that supported castle life. These might consist of barracks, a kitchen and stores. The whole construction was protected by a surrounding ramp and ditch. The mott stood at the, at the northerly most point of the hill at the apex of a triangular shaped platform. It was flat topped and had a diameter of 100 feet. To the south of it was the bailey which was an irregular square measuring 120 feet east to west and 100 feet north to south. And indeed, comparing Fishwick's drawing to the 1900s map, one can see that the area once occupied by the church, and now by housing, was not actually a part of the bailey, but was actually on the, gra the gradient of the hill. The bailey is far more immediately adjacent to the house and does not cover the whole area known as Castle Hill today. And it is actually still extant beneath the tarmac. The tarmac that crests uh, Castle Hill today is on the level of the bailey. Now, after the conquest, the Norman, the Norman knight Roger of Poitou was given much of the land in Lancashire. Though Gamble continued to own land in the area, Roger became its lord, and the castle, if there was a Saxon one on the site, will certainly have fallen into Norman hands, which lends even more credence to the uh, Motton Bailey theory. The castle was finally abandoned around the early 1200s, although the reason for this is not quite clear. It was certainly known about for some time afterwards, and even continued to exert an effect socially. Thomas Dunn and Whittaker, in A History of the Original Parish of Wally and, and Honour of Clitheroe in the counties of Lancaster and York, published in 1818, traces the history of the castle as far as he can, writing that it does not receive any mention in the Doomsday Book, but that it seems to have been afterwards, i.e. after its closure, restored. As the burgesses of a decayed castle here are mentioned as late as the reign of Edward II, which was from 1307 to 1327, roughly a century after the site had been abandoned. Even by the 17th century, little was left and even less was known of the castle. Gardner remarks that the site is still known as Castle Hill. It has long borne this name, for in, the, for in a lease to the tenant in 1626, the house upon it is called Castle Hill and is further described as the reputed site of a castle standing there, but now clean defaced. In an inquisition taken in 1610, the same house and its appurtenances are mentioned and are described as covering two and a half acres, which coincides with the measurements of the present, of present residential property. So if the castle was a mystery even by the 17th century, what hope have we of discovering more about it today? It wasn't until some 600 years later, after the castle's closure, that it would be re-examined. As the new turnpike road was being planned and would, as stated earlier, clip the hill, a survey was necessary, and Bowden tells us that at, th at this time, the upper Mott and lower Bailey areas could still be made out, as could the mounds of earth forming the defensive structure of the south and west sides. It was noted that the north and east signs were naturally inclined, so did not need much ad addition in the way of earthworks, which is precisely what Fishwick's illustration shows. It shows us a remarkably shallow gradient to the south and southeast, compared with those to the northwest, the north, and the, and the east, the latter facing what is today Rochdale Town Centre. It is interesting to compare the downgrade of Sparth Bottoms Road running down next to Castle Hill, uh, to the incline onto Castle Hill, to see just how difference, uh, how, how sheer the difference in height really is. Um, this is further accentuated where one considers that even the terrace houses lining the road 
are at a higher point than the road's surface. So could Sparkbottom's road actually lie in an artificial trench built to protect the castle? Well, as it turns out, possibly. Gardner's text contains the following piece of information. There are traces of an outer fosse on the west and south sides only. Probably the very steep, very steep slopes of the hill were sufficient protection elsewhere. The plan made in 1823, that is, Fishwick's plan, shows a second fosse described as eight feet deep at the foot of the hill on the south and southeast, where the natural defence was less strong. This also probably guarded the ancient entrance at the southeast corner towards the old highway. Given that Gardner designates what is left of the fosse as merely a trace, it could be that while perhaps the road's lowest point is at the base of the fosse, its width has since eradicated all trace of its defensive capabilities. But still, the question remains, is there some evidence under Sparthbottom's road that this was an earthwork and not simply a natural valley or incline? Alas, since that time, very little has been uncovered. Uh, Mr. Page, curator of the Rochdale Museum, which is today's Touchstones, cut a trench across what was left of the Bailey in 1972. He found only pottery dating to the Georgian era. However, something less tangible, but far more resilient, survives. The name. Castleton still exists, but it is quite literally not what it once was, because Castleton today is the area that was once known as Blue Pits Village. It was named Blue Pits because of the blue clay that was mined from its underbelly, but it derives its, its present name from Castle Hill. Now, I grew up in Castleton, and I still live there today. Since I was a child, I've heard stories of a mysterious place where a castle is meant to have been long ago in the times of knights and kings and gallantry and honour. But I'd always dismissed it as an urban legend, a uh, bedtime story to tell your kids. Nobody could ever point me to the precise point at which the castle is meant to have, uh, meant to have stood. Until, and I must credit him here, the ever-knowledgeable John Lord on the Facebook group The Village of Castleton showed me where he'd heard it was. It is strange to think about this structure, built a thousand years ago, and it's still being discussed. It's still attracting curiosity. I wonder what Gamma would think of us, and I wonder what we'll have been to those who live a thousand years from now. So thanks for listening, everyone. I do hope you enjoyed the video. Please bear in mind, it is my first one. Uh, so if it seems a little rough around the edges, that's why. Maybe I'll remake it one day in the future when I'm some sort of master YouTuber. Who knows? But thank you very much. Ta-ra for now.